Chef Nara. Hi. Yes. I, I was just saying that, you know, you're, you like, like usually I got to like drag people on like kicking and screaming and like, you know, you, you're here early, you know, you're like trying to get on. So thank you for being prompt. I like to be prepared. <laughs> it makes me feel calmer. Was it, I, I tell stories about my first trip to Switzerland that I, like I get off the plane and I go downstairs to the, the, the station and I'm super worried that my German is really lousy. Right? <laughs> like, that, like I've been practicing how to buy a ticket to, to buy a ticket to get to, to the Zurich, you know, the main Zurich station. Yes. And I finally get to the front and I start to speak in German and the agent looks at me and goes, would you prefer to speak in English? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm, I now tell them where I'm going and she goes, you better hurry. You have two minutes. And she meant it. Like, mm -hmm. like I skirted through the door, the doors closed. And that was my, my whole, that's how I feel about it. the rest of my first Swiss trip was like that. <laughs> the and, it, and it's the, the, the directions for the trains and changing are very true. I mean, they give you a whole printout schedule, which platform, whereabouts to be on the platform. And you look at the times and you think I'm never going to make it. And you actually do <laughs> make it. Yeah. The, the bus, the first time I was on a bus and the bus pulls over. I'm like, why? Does, doors don't open. We just pulled over. So I, I'm like, walk up to the driver. I'm like, why are we pulled over? He goes, we're at two minutes early. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> cool. As opposed to my trip to Italy, I went to Egypt last February. You know, and I'm, I'm staying in Bologna and like the train station is chaos. And, yes. You know, where do I, what platform? Well, probably platform eight. But if it changes, <laughs> we'll let you know, like, as the train's pulling in, and you'll just need to scamper. Like, great. Yeah, so it makes you feel very confident, right? <laughs> hey, so we're going to do a bit of, so speaking of Rimini, you're well versed with Rimini. Yes, I've been there three times now um, for the uh, Queen of Pastry competition in Italy. So, um, I had the um, honor of um, being invited to represent the country the first time around in 2012 when it was the first competition they'd run like this. So it's an all female competition um, which runs over almost like one and a half days. Um, and it's everything from, you know, plated desserts, frozen entremet, uh, something you have to kind of do with a, a mystery ingredient in front of international press within 30 minutes, build a sugar showpiece. Very Italian. It's a lot. It's Wing a it. very big program. Yeah. Right. So very challenging. Um, the timing has to be right. Um, takes a lot of practice, obviously, and a lot of runs to, to get it right. But um, so in 2012, um, Italy placed first, France second, and US was third. So got on the podium, which I was very happy about. Um, obviously, you know, whenever I compete, I like to go to win. And so um, even though third place was, was very nice, I was, you know, at the time a little disappointed, but looking back, I think I did okay. Um, and then two years later, I coached the pastry chef from Hotel Hershey, Cher Harris. And uh, we got first. So that was amazing for the US. Um, and uh, then we had to sit out. And then we went back four years later. And then uh, Laura from Indianapolis, uh, Coach Laura, and she got second place. So every time we've been, we've been on the top three, which I think for the US is really great when we're against, you know, Italy, France, Switzerland, Japan. Um, you know, all those international countries that are very, very well known and have been for a long time with pastry. Right. So I was really proud that every time that we went, we were able to, you know, prove that we belonged, really. And I did kind of jump into the story. I like, I, I sort of segued into Rimini really fast and, and we'll, we'll loop back around about competitions and how yes. you ended up there. But you're right. I mean, I think that if you look at international competitions, the United States sparingly does well right there's a there's a there's a second place finish here and then there's there's a break and then there's a third place finish and then there's yes. a break and then there's there's a win right? which is really amazing you know it'll be a monumental and um, then and then there's a long break again and and 
my opinion about that is I think, I don't know that we have the, we don't, as pastry professionals in this country, we don't have the support of whoever we need to finance and train and do all of those things very often. Yeah, I mean, it's tough because it's such a big country as well. Right. And we are so spread out and within a team, we want to have diversity and people from different regions of the country as well and give everybody a fair shot in that, you know. But it makes training and, and bringing everybody together very expensive right. um, because you're flying in. It's not simply you're driving to the next town and everybody's got their equipment and things there. You know, you almost have to have a, a like a base that you can always go to every month. And then, um, I mean, you've got to be fortunate enough to work for somebody that is going to give you the time and uh, realize that this is important um, for yourself, but also for the industry. Um, and you've got to work, be able to work for those employees that, that value that and will support that and understand that you, you need the time, you need the time to practice. I mean, a lot of it's on your own time, obviously. Right. Um, but you still need that, like, if you are practicing, you can't have people walking in the room all the time or in the kitchen asking for things. And, you hey, know, chef, where's the raspberry puree? Distracting. You, you, you know, it's like if you're there and it's your workplace and you're practicing there, everybody thinks you're at work, yeah. where you really have to have that kind of separation. So I think, um, but also what I find as well, it's just um, competitors begin it, be willing to make the commitment. Um, I know when, you know, I was looking for, for female chefs to train for Queen of Pastry, it, it's, not, it's not easy. I know the commitment. I know the time it takes and what's involved in it, obviously. But, um, but there's not that many people out there that are willing to put themselves out. And I know competition is not for everybody. I completely understand that. And it's, some, you know, um, it's just not doable for some. But, but considering the size of the country... We should have more more chefs being willing to put themselves out there and commit to being involved. Yeah, that's a tough, I mean, it's a tough conversation too. Like, I think, I mean, you probably do, I mean, you and I have both done a handful of Food Network things, you more than I. You know, we've both competed at different levels of competition. And so, you know, I haven't done as much as you, but I think I know what it really takes, right? Yeah. But, you know, we get those calls from the casting agent of the new the new show right yeah. like hey this is what what we're doing and you should do that because you can win twenty five thousand dollars whatever i'm making up a number right and i think you know look i've won a food network thing i got the big check and i know how little money i got because of, of those things you're talking about right mm -hmm. like i had to give money to my assistant. I had to pay for this many airplane tickets. I had to buy this many pounds of chocolate to practice that chocolate showpiece yeah. 14 times. And, and I can call Calibo and get out of state chocolate shipped to me, right? Like mm -hmm. I can do that. Yeah. But I don't, you know, I don't get all those hours back and I definitely don't get no. compensated for those hours. You have to you do it don't. because you want to do it. Yeah. And, you, yeah, you, you can't do it for the money. Uh, that, that's the wrong, you know, um, I mean, if you have a business and you go on Food Network or one of the shows, you know, the streaming, I think it can really help your business. Um, it can get, you know, and, and the general public loves that. I mean, they, they, they don't care about the Culinary Olympics, no. but they do care about Halloween Wars. Um, and it's just because it's in front of the public and, and they see it on TV and, and that, carries a certain aura with it and notoriety and if you have a business you know I think it, it can help you it can catapult you but then you have to deliver too um, right. but you know I think for me you know obviously and I think with Food Network is about and the networks it's about casting that they're, they're looking for characters um, they're not looking that you want to do something as perfect as you can possibly make it that's not what it's about. It's about, unfortunately, capturing that. I mean, I love like the British Baking Show because they, they bring humanity to it. You know, 
Mary Berry is like, oh, don't worry. That I thought that tasted really good when, you know, the others are saying, well, I'm not sure about it. It's not baked properly. Well, that was really good. You know, there's always that little positive twist on it. They don't demoralize people. And, um, and it's a great show. It's, right. it's so successful and, and they do really good stuff, you know. Um, and it's a shame that, you know, like I think a lot of the TV networks have taken, it's, it's the drama and, and it's, it's the casting of characters. Whereas I think with the professional competitions, it, it is about your skill level and you're up against your peers. Right. I mean, which it is, is more about, important. Right. It, it, nobody's celebrating in Lyon when the piece breaks. No. Right. Oh. Like when, when the piece hits the floor in Lyon, and we're talking about the Coupe de Monde, the, the, the granddaddy of the wall in regards to, for those of you who don't know what, what we're talking about, when the, when the show piece falls on Lyon, the groans are real and people yeah. are sad for the. The other competitors they are They feel sad. for it. Yeah, they right. feel. When, when mm -hmm. the piece falls on Food Network, like when my piece fell on Food Network, the, 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 the producer's comment was, we missed that on camera. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> and I go to get a broom and I go to sweep it up and they go, don't, don't touch that. Like we got to yeah. get pictures of it on the ground. It's just like really like mm, it's yeah. It's not you don't you don't leave with a with a good feeling. I think and when and then when it's finished, you're out the door. I mean, the next crew is coming in, and it's not like well, how are you going to get to the airport? It's like okay, we're done. Flights at so and so by. Yeah. They don't they don't care. I had to quickly say my sister is watching from England. Julia, Jules Cake, so Hi Susan shout sister. Out to my little sister Julia. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> but yeah, I mean it, it, it I mean I think that Food Network and Pastry Championship and Carrie Max and all that did incredible things for yeah. our profession. Like I don't I'm not I'm not dismissing that at all. Like because I know a lot of the producers and I know the early yeah. Carrie Max people and I don't want to say I'm not I please in no way am I trying to like degrade no, what they did. No. But I think in some ways it's changed competition. It's changed people's expectations of going into the, into the industry. Right. And I'm not a really good person to lament that. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I got food network helped to kind of create some of who I am because I had this, on my resume and I had this here. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a part of it, but it's part of a lot of other things. And I know when we were, you know, I was teaching and, you know, as director of a pastry arts program at a school, you know, the first few days is like, this is the reality of the industry. And, you know, the reality, and we were, we were tough on them. I mean, it's, we almost wanted them, the ones that weren't serious about it and weren't dedicated, we'd rather they, they realize that early on and not spent all that money and that time and effort and our investment in them as well in, you know, in making that decision. So I think, you know, you have to be real. Um, right. Cause the reality of it is, and I, mm -hmm. I used to, I, I taught here as well. And I yeah. started teaching pastry one oh one. you know, like that, the, the, I had to wear like a tie that class, <laughs> and like stand in front of a chalkboard. <laughs> Sorry, a dry erase board. And like review like the metric system and flour and right. And yes. The first day of class, I would ask, welcome. I'm glad you're here. What do you want to do with this? Right. And there's 28 kids in a class and 24 of them would say, I want to make cakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who's moving? Because 24 of you aren't <laughs> going to be able to make cakes <laughs> in Buffalo. Like, That's right. And, mm -hmm. and there were students in that class that would get offended. Like yeah. you were saying about students that weren't serious. And there were kids who were like, they took that as a challenge. Yes. Oh, they'll eat my cakes. Cool. You're mm -hmm. in. Let's go. Let's go yeah, to the, that's let's good. Go to the I mean, that's the, that's the attitude you want, you know? Um, right. Because I think once, I mean, I tell the story too, you know, my first day in the kitchen, my first three days in the kitchen, I wasn't allowed in the kitchen. Like I was polishing plates in the hallway. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how much did I just spend for culinary school? <laughs> like, I quit my job. Like, I got mortgage to pay. I'm cleaning plates. Yes. Right. And I, and I don't think everyone needs to go through that experience. I did. But 
That's sometimes it. I just, sometimes I told you, sometimes I'm just testing you. Right. You I, know, I'd say if they give you a case of apples and they tell you to peel it, don't be mad that they do that. Be the best apple peeler they've ever seen. And because next time when there's a task that comes and they need somebody they know is going to complete it correctly, they're going to pick you. So see it, see every, every opportunity, see it, see everything. You know, I always believe things, everything you do leads somewhere. Right. You might not realize it quite at the time, but, but I think you have to look at it in a positive, a positive way. Yeah. We had, it's funny when I was at the Ritz, we had, we had, we regularly had interns from a prestigious school. Yes. We'll leave it there. And they would cycle through the kitchen. Right. And so they would end up in the bake shop in the pastry kitchen. And we had one that I took the, I literally put the case of apples on and I peel a case, I peel an apple, I cut an apple and I go, I need you to do this. And she looks at me and goes, how many? And I go, <laughs> the case. And she looks at me and goes, I'm not here to peel apples. And I'm like, well, then you're not here. Mm -hmm. Right. Unfortunately, I wasn't the executive pastry chef. So I walk around the corner to the executive pastry chef and I tell the executive pastry chef, she says she's not peeling apples, chef. Yeah. And he goes, well, get her the, out of my kitchen. And so I walk right around the corner and I'm like, chef has said, we don't need you. And she was like, why not? I'm like, cause yeah. you're here to peel. Cause I'm sorry. You're here to peel apples for an hour. Yes. Yeah. I know. I mean, you, I think you have to prepare. We always try to prepare our students to know, you know, what they would face and, you know, and then I would get really, actually really great feedback from the chefs that had them as externs. I mean, it had quite a lot actually go down to Norman loves. And they ended up staying. And I think that was a real testament to our program that we, you know, we were a small program, a one year diploma program, but we really tried to give them the best that we could. And I had a great team of instructors and we were all really dedicated to the students and really tried to raise the bar. And I was lucky at that time I could bring guest speakers in. I mean, Abold would come and teach for three days in our program. Karen Portaleo came and taught them cakes and, you know, through these connections and what we could do with the school, we were able to really expose them to, you know, some industry greats, really. They were very fortunate. And, um, and then they, 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 they were successful. And it's nice to still them see in the, I still see them in the industry, you know, and I see them on social media and right. on their pages and still stay in contact with the different chefs. So, you know, I think, again, it's just bringing that reality in and, and there's, there's lots of really great things about our industry, but we have, we have to be realistic about, you know, what it is and the hours and, you know, it's hard work. <laughs> it's, it's, it is, it's hard work and you've got to know you, you it's, and you would just say, you know, because we had a lot of females, right? And there's, there's no, we had to say, tough it up, you know, <laughs> there's no crying in pastry. Right. Get I mean, on with it. I, yeah, I mean, there's somebody asking, you know, do students really know that? And I think that's up to the program to tell them. And I think there's a fear in programs, especially for-profit programs. Yes. Right, that if you tell someone, hey, here's the reality of it, you are not going to make $60,000 a year. You are not going to be the executive pastry chef in a hotel. And you're going to have to work 60 hours a week when you walk out the door. That, that may all come. Like, the executive mm -hmm. pastry chef position is going to come the money will come um, yeah. sort of the, you know, the <laughs> yeah. only working, only working 50 hours a week may come. Yeah. Right. But you're going to have to, you're going to have to walk that path for longer than two weeks. Yeah. And, I, and, and that's what I meant about the food network thing is I think there's this mentality that you graduate from culinary school and that's not just on the pastry side. I think that's hot Every, chef. Everybody yeah. thinks cool. I walk out the door and the jacket says chef and I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, I think Susan, we'll get it. Let's, I mean, I did say we're going to get to your story. We're 20 minutes in, but I think your story says you got to do some work. Like you gotta yes. go to, as my grandfather yes. used to say, you got to go to the woodshed. Yeah. Right. You know, Albert Uster, he I've used heard of to him. say, Hey, great. I mean, I miss him still. Okay. So, so do I. So, so for I everybody miss him else, so much. no, um, Susan, but, Susan, Susan, one sec. So for everybody that doesn't know, Susan used to be the executive pastry chef for Albert Easter Imports, now AUI Swiss. But yes. anyway, long story. And, yeah. and yeah. prior, and I was the assistant after Susan left. I worked for Anil Rohira who replaced Susan. But we both were working in the kitchen and Albert is a real person or was mm -hmm. a real person chef. and was a chef larger than life. Yeah. 
one of the finest human beings on the planet if he liked you. <laughs> yeah, he could be, oh, it could be terrible. <laughs> but anyway, so now you can tell your story about Albert. Yeah, so Albert would say, because people would say to him, you know, oh, go to America, the streets are paved with gold. And he would say, yes, but you have to bend down to pick it up. You, you have to make the effort. You know? Wow, that's a great Albert line. I don't know Isn't that. it? <laughs> I've had some of the best meals in my life with Albert and some of the worst. <laughs> Because if he did not like what was coming out on the table, he would go in the kitchen and, and Anne, um, one of his wives, <laughs> would say, Daddy's doing his I'm a chef routine again. <laughs> yeah, but the funny thing about Albert was, like, you could go to, like, the fishing retreat in, like, northern Montana, where there were, like, three people within 100 miles, right? <laughs> and Albert would know one of them. Yes. <laughs> I'd be like, best friends. And they would have this story about when they drank grappa in the, you know, in the, in Italy, in, you know, whatever year. And it was just like, yes. all right, I'll be at the table finishing dinner because I got nothing for that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazing person. I mean, yeah. So my one Albert story, one, Albert, Albert comes back from Switzerland one year. Or one week, whatever, but whatever. And he chucks a bunch of books across the marble at me. And the marble's the same. They've redone the kitchen, but the marble's the same one that mm -hmm. you and I both worked on, right? And they're, they're from Richemont. And they're in German. And I flip the first one open, and um, I, okay, I put it down. I look at the second one, it's in German. I look at the third one. I said, I've already said my German was really bad. And it's worse now. And I go, hey, boss, as he's walking out the door, I'm like, they're all in German. And he goes, you haven't picked up German yet? I'm like, well, I've worked here three months. So, no. And I didn't know I needed to. And he goes, you know what you need? You need to start hanging out with the interns. And like, just like stops off. He didn't talk to me for like a week because I didn't learn German. But, but that is, but it was, but it was from love, right? I mean, it was like, yes. Like, yeah. he wanted me to lo love Switzerland as much as he loves Switzerland. And he wanted me to love, be as passionate about the, the recipes in that guide as he was passionate about it. And, and I was doing him a disservice for not being able to understand. Yeah. yeah. But I miss him, too. Like, I was, we, I, we talk about him all the time. Chris and I talk. So my wife, also, Christina, who you know, yes. worked for AUI for years, too, and was a special place. Both yes. Albert and him had a special place in each other's hearts. So, yeah. you know, we... Yeah. We raise it. We raise a toast. We do. To Poppy. <laughs> I need a glass of wine to say to Poppy. You know. <laughs> oh, Kish. <laughs> I think I still have a bottle from uh, what's it in Fassbinder, and that you know. Yeah, my nice. Life nice. It's slowly getting lower, even though I don't drink any of it. I think it's just evaporating you need, now. You need to drink it. <laughs> or at least make a recipe with it, or do something with it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, so let's get back to you. Okay. We've talked about competition. We've talked about Albert. We've talked about Switzerland a little bit. But clearly from the accent and your sister lives in England, you are not originally from the United States. No, no. So um, how did you get into pastry and why? Um, I, well, I, I don't come from a family of um, bakers. Um, I had a great uncle, that I think, that I never met that did actually have a bakery. But I unfortunately never, never met him. Met him. But um, I just... Um, as a kid, always just loved to be in the kitchen. And I would, I would make cakes and things. And my mother, I mean, I was the, I'm the oldest of four girls. And um, she had four children in five years, which now having three of my own kids very spread out, I, I, like, I don't know how she did it. Um, so there wasn't a lot of baking going on. It was just like what we need to eat. And at that time, like my parents didn't go out and buy like, you know, unique cookies and cakes and things. It was like, this is dinner and this is what you're going to eat. So in order to really kind of get anything sweet, which I enjoyed, I had to make it. So I just would follow, you know, recipe books and I would make, you know, all the classic British desserts and things. And then at a Trifle. very early age, like 11 and 12 years old, I was organizing all my sister's birthday parties. I would do the food. We would, my friend and I, we put an order in at a local grocery store. We would walk there. We would get our box of stuff. We would walk home with it. 
And then I would do all the food for the party and the games and organize it. And my mum would just show up and say, this is great. <laughs> and I was, I, you know, it's like thinking, looking back. I mean, I was pretty young to do that, but it just, and then my cakes always, I made them look like something, you know, it just couldn't be a cake. It had to be like a sculpted, something three-dimensional. So then I, um, in school, um, I took home ec, home economics. And normally what I made turned out pretty good. So, you know, I felt that I had a certain, you know, knack for doing this. Um, and um, a girl, you know, of course, continued to bake at home. And then I kind of discovered that there's something called culinary school. Uh, we called it actually catering college in England. <laughs> um, and um, so um, I actually worked, um, I left school and I worked in a small hotel for a year. Uh, front of house, back of the house, got to do the dessert cart. I mean, I was 16 years old and they, they entrusted the dessert cart to me. So I did all of that. Please and, know um, this is not helping into my life. You're going to go out and be the executive pastry chef the moment you walk out of school argument. You're like, you're like <laughs> telling me. No, no. Um, and then um, I found out, you know, I could attend culinary school. So I, you know, applied and got into culinary school. And I did... Um, a very, you know, at that time, I mean, I was in, this was in the early, like late 70s, early 80s, right? England was not renowned for its cuisine, let alone its pastry. I mean, you're lucky if you got an iced bun. <laughs> that was, um, and I didn't live in London, so I was middle no England. Com no, com no comments, I won't. I will, I will, I will, make, it has got a lot better. So I, will make no, I will make no British food comments at all. <laughs> it's I mean, not best. Other than everything, why is everything brown? Why is everything brown? Everything on the table is brown with like Look parsley. Look at the weather. So you should want vibrant food to make up for the fact that everything <laughs> you on would, the table you is brown. You would think so. And then they have a problem with seasoning too and overcooking. But nothing, I won't, I won't nothing bring something on England. Nothing sauce can't fix. A little <laughs> so, HP sauce and... HP, yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. So anyway, so um, I started work. I started going to culinary school and... Um, did actually a hotel degree management program um but we had culinary and um we had my sister saying we like to be healthy okay thank you julia for that point <laughs> so um but um you know because i'd worked for a year in the hotel what i learned was really relevant and then also i had that years a year of experience before going to culinary school which put me also kind of ahead of the game as well so um i actually in school first year we didn't have any pastry that came in second year but i was working part-time every weekend i would travel to a bakery in a little place called melton mowbray where the pork pies and stilton cheese come from and i would work in this little father-son owned bakery and i'd go there every weekend and work and then monday through friday i've been been you know in the culinary school and in the first year we had a competition in school and it was with all the schools in the region um, and I thought okay I'm going to enter and I went to the library we had a library right and I pulled out a book on Swiss pastry and it was an afternoon a platter of afternoon tea pastries six different ones so many of each I didn't tell anybody I was entering I didn't tell my boss I was working for I didn't tell my instructors at school I don't even know where I made anything right <laughs> I can't remember and I entered and I won my category and I won best of show. And I'm like, wow, and I got a trophy, <laughs> you know, a big trophy. So then that kind of gave me the bug a little bit for, you know, competitions and, um, you know, went through culinary school, graduated, and I'd always wanted to travel more. And that was my thing. It's like, I want to, you know, go to different places, learn different things. And I had the opportunity after leaving culinary school to go to Germany. And I was like so excited. And I said, you know, I applied for the job and I, I got the job. And, uh, and then I told my parents and they're like, where are you going to live? And how are you going to pay for all of this? And I'm like, I'll figure it out. And I did. But did and you speak German at least? No. Um, I, I did take some night classes once I found out so I, I could get my basics of like, you know, airport suitcase lost, you know, kind of 
that was worse. <laughs> Which Where's is the thing bathroom? is that I kind of got those. Um, because, so I, I, I got to Germany. I got there. My sister's saying she got my bedroom when I left, so I'm sure she appreciated that. Um, I got to Germany. And, you know, you, you pick up your suitcase. And I had the director. It was a pretty big place. They had a, a central commissary with 10 stores and I worked, everybody worked to the commissary and every morning everything went out to the stores. So I got, I was able to kind of move around every three months to a different department, which was great. So um, the HR director helps me with my suitcase, takes me to the plant, shows me, okay, tomorrow morning, like 5 a.m. here. And I'm like, okay, you know, then he drives me back to the place I'm gonna be staying, which is on the top floor with no heat of this house, of course, you know, I'd hang my socks up to dry, they'd freeze. <laughs> it was like... Glamour, so, Susan. This is, Chef, yeah, glamour. Yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is exactly, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the story of, like, the hardship. <laughs> the frozen just, socks, right? I, I, want, then... I, want, I want a competition the first time out, and then they play the only job I can get, like, my socks won't fall. <laughs> So I, I get to the, so that I get back to my room and my suitcase is really heavy and I open it up and I thought, oh, has my mum bought me some new clothes, which would be very unusual, you know? And then I realized it wasn't my suitcase. So off I go back down the stairs and I find my way back and I like get to the place and I'm like, minor coffer, niche, minor coffer. It's like, my suitcase is not my suitcase. And then, you know, I arrived at the place and I was still kind of nice I want to make a good impression so I had little heels on and a nice skirt and all the rest of it and when you walk into the plant there was grids on the floor like you know when cattle go over the ground because all the water would go in there I think I it's walked, called a sluice a sluice okay thank you a sluice and then you would I got there and I stood in the sluice and my heels got stuck so here I am just arrived <laughs> My heels are stuck in the sluice. I've got the wrong suitcase. And they're probably thinking, oh, my gosh, what is this, you know? Why didn't we hire a German? Like <laughs> a good German to. girl. <laughs> so anyway, so we remedied all that. And the next day I got to work. And um, I just I just loved doing you know I was I was in the Taunton department and I got to layer and finish and glaze and you know and I just started like talking to trying to talk to everybody and that's how I picked up German and um, you know and then uh, you know the Germans are kind of, you know the English are fairly crude I would say like reserved and the Germans aren't right so one day it was summer and they said, do you want to come swimming? Like a group. And I'm like, yeah, sure, you know. And we get to this lake in the middle of a field. There's not a changing room to be seen, right? And I'm like, where do I change? You know, like, and they're just laughing at me. And of course, I couldn't understand that much German. So, you know, I get my towel around me and I'm doing the whole little thing. And, and then I did that. Then one of their friends shows up, this other girl. She just takes everything off and puts a bikini on. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> that's why they were laughing at me. <laughs> so you kind of get used to different things. I mean, I would never probably strip naked in a field in front of a bunch that people I didn't know. But, but um, you know, you kind of learn what to do and um, learn the ways of the country and the customs. And um, so I ended up spending about two and a half years in Germany and had a great time. I was 19, lived alone. Um, made a bunch of friends, they were super nice to me, and worked and got paid for doing what I loved. So, it was it was really cool. I was very lucky. And from there, where'd we go? Then it was Switzerland. So, um, for me, like, Switzerland was always, like, the mecca, especially chocolate and confectionery. And um, my the person I worked for in Germany, because they, they owned a lot of stores and they were very successful, and they had a lot of contacts. So we often had um, international other chefs coming from different countries. And um, so my boss, the owner, would sit in the middle of the bakery in his office, surrounded by windows, on the phone, like two phones sometimes, like all morning long. So if I wanted to talk to him, 
there were certain windows of opportunity that you had to catch him. Now, I'm about five foot one, right? He was like six foot six. So anytime I wanted anything, like to move up departments or to go to Switzerland, I would have to catch him. So I'd wait till I knew he was leaving the building. It was like one o'clock. And I would just beeline for him, right? And, and he'd be like these big strides and I'd be walking along beside him. And I'd like, Heineman, Heineman, can I have a minute? <laughs> and so, so one of my questions was, I want to go to Switzerland. Can he help me? And he did. Um, so off the English girl went, um, speaking German, thinking that would be fine. And I get to Switzerland and Swiss And they speak a totally German, different German. Like the German is not the same. The dialects, the grammar, there's French words in there. Because I at first thought, I'll be okay, right? And I get to, so I get to Switzerland and first of all, I'm in Lucerne. And Lucerne is actually fairly near where now where Felton is, but Lucerne is in the center of Switzerland and surrounded by mountains. And I, I love the Swiss. I really do. I love the country. It's so in my heart. But when Swiss people are surrounded by mountains, their worldviews are fairly like blinkered, right? Especially to foreigners. And so I went to work at a and I was put in the chocolate department I was very fortunate in both you know both there and at Confessory Honold in Zurich I was in the chocolate department so I go there to work I'm the only foreigner in there and I'm female right and I don't speak Swiss German I mean that's three strikes right there so it was it was like you know I was always known okay the, the English girl right <laughs> so so gradually, I began to kind of pick up an ear for Swiss German and, and, you know, get to understand it. But I go to the stores, and as soon as I opened my mouth, it was like the window was down. It was, it was tough. I, it was a very lonely time. But I was like, I'm going to persevere, right? I'm going to do this. And um, after, after the CERN, I got a work permit for Zurich. And I thought, I need to go because... Um, I've got this permit. When am I going to have this opportunity again? And I went to Zurich and it was so different. It was this international city. Um, there were so many different nationalities that worked at Honold. Um, I was included in things. And so it was, a, it was a great experience. And it's funny now because a couple of years ago, I was back in Lucerne and I went back to that, to that confessory um, where I've worked. And the father, who was the owner at that point, now it's his sons and grandsons, was in the store. And I went to, up to him and I, and I said, Herr Bachmann, I don't know if you remember me, but, and he said, oh yeah. And I, I said, well, he, I said, how many people, how many different nationalities now work there? 22. So from, so from being just one, you know, and, right. and then now 22 different nationalities work there. So that was pretty amazing. But, but Zurich was great. And in Zurich, I began to find out, find out about all these different classes I could take, like the local Gewerbeschule, where, the, where all the apprentices went for school. Right. There was evening classes. Freddie Eckenschwiller taught them with all the marzipan and everything. And then Karma had a teaching facility near Zurich, Karma Forum, where they had a lot of guests come in and teach. And then one of my roommates one day came home with the Madame Pompadour out of sugar, and I'm like, where did you make that? <laughs> I have to learn this, you know? And off I went to sugar school. And that's where I met Ewald. And I always say, you know, he needed, and, and I would always watch what he did and how he worked. And, and then he would go person to person and he would get to me and I'd have all these petals made, right? And it's like, what are you doing? I, I'm practicing. <laughs> and and uh, I always say, he needed an assistant. But I think it was cheaper for him to date me than to hire an assistant. So we started dating. <laughs> That's all in very good humor. <laughs> no so comment about English being, food, um, no comment about years. dating <laughs> So yeah, I spent 10 years in Zurich. And then uh, in the, got married, uh, ran the sugar school with Evolve. We traveled internationally, wrote books, made videos when videos weren't even a thing. You know, we, we didn't have... Right. Facebook, Instagram, anything at that point, it was all, it was word of mouth. And it was us going to shows and doing demos. 
um, and just trying to get in front of people and that, that reputation spreading. So there were some times that every month we were teaching in a different country right. and we would get back and then we would, um, you know, start teaching in our own school. And um, it was, it was um, a very exciting time, a very exhausting time. It really well, was. Because this, this is funny to me. It won't be funny to anybody else. Do you wrap everything in three sheets of plastic wrap then? Like <laughs> two directions? <laughs> shoes and suitcases everything's in plastic wrap <laughs> right it's like so my the people that have worked for me along the way make fun of me because like you know anil did that because they will did that and i do that because anil did that like i take a wrap i take plastic wrap with me in case there isn't plastic wrap when i get somewhere so i can wrap myself back in plastic wrap and put it back in the bag <laughs> it makes perfect sense right it, it does yeah <laughs> Do I need to take the the roll of plastic wrap and wrap that in plastic wrap though? Like you know, you might need to. You never know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so it was an amazing. I mean, just having the school and running our own business. Um, you know, we'd have twelve students maximum. It was all hands on. We would teach individually, everybody. Um, and sometimes you know, it was like it was always like multiple nationalities coming to class. It was really cool. And there wasn't that point, there weren't many opportunities to, if you're already trained, to go further what you were learning in a certain discipline. That, um, that just wasn't available, you know, at that time. So I think we just, timing was right. Um, we um, were very open about what we taught. And, and we didn't, we, 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 we broke it down. So it, did, it wasn't a disillusion, it was real. Yeah. Right, and I, and I think, Susan, like, you know, I mean, we've known each other longer than I would admit, probably a decade and a half now, right? But, I mean, I think in that era of pastry and of, of teaching and chefs, so 20 years ago, let's say, because there wasn't the Internet and there wasn't this no. immediate thing, we were ridiculously open. Like mm -hmm. you've always been open about technique or about ingredient or recipe, but you, but the gatekeeper was having to get there, right? So like yeah. you had to get there. And I think now in some ways, there's a lot more information out there, but there's less transparency about how it's ultimately done. Like you can yeah. pay for that. Like you can, you can, you can, you know, you can cough it up and get that information as fast as you want, whatever you're willing to pay for. And, but you've got to do that, right? But you can get it immediately. Yes. Right. And yeah. I think that's, in some ways, there's some really great stuff about this sort of like Instagram, like concept all the time. But like I did something yesterday for our Instagram page and I didn't tell somebody how to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. I put it out there. I'm like, you can look at it and you can see it's nice. But if you yeah. really want to know, you've got to come to me and you've got to ask. I'm not going to like, I'm mm -hmm. not going to give it to you. And the difference is I'll give it to you for free yes. because I get paid to give it to you for free. But yeah. I'm not just going to throw out there what I did. And, you know, I think that's a, a paradigm change maybe in how we do things. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, it's researching as well. I mean, I, you know, there has to be a value. And, it, and if it's just simply it's all free or it's all given. I mean, we've had to learn that. I mean, it's, I'll, I'll pass on anything. Um, and a lot of people message me about, you know, different, lots of different things, not, not just chocolate, but, um, you know, equipment maybe, or where to source something. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to share whatever I can. Um, but it's then it's like, it's still, you know, what do they, what, what does somebody do with that information? Right. But you and I get paid. I mean, we're, I mean, you're now the corporate pastry chef for North America, right? North America, U S yeah. I, uh, U.S. is my, my territory for, for Felpen. Another yes. Swiss, another Swiss company. Yes. Because you really love Switzerland. And like, like in that way, you know, we're not running a business. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, our roles are designed to help, like in my case, you know, help you yes. use this better. Right. Yeah. And so if you can use it better in a recipe or you can use it better making bars, it doesn't matter to me. I'm here to help you get better. Yeah. And you're there to help people make better recipes with with the chocolate that you help yeah, to sell. I, ideally, yes. Right. Yeah. And so we are supposed to be a resource. I mean, yeah. 
which we're both pretty privileged in that. I mean, there's something really. No, it's it's. Um, it's way it's, easier it's, in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's way easier than having to like make sure that you sell a thousand pieces of, you know, petite yeah. today. I mean, it's. I think it's trying to um, enable others to be successful and and help them as much as we can along the way. Right, but anyway, so I were. We're actually running out of time. You thought that like we weren't gonna have anything to talk about because you gave me a whole <laughs> list of questions and I've asked one, um, and I don't know that I've really asked it. I, but uh, let's. I mean, so you end up in the United States and things happen, and you end up working for a producer for a while, and then you leave AUI, and you end up teaching for a while in Alabama. Which mm -hmm. I, somebody asked me earlier why Alabama. I'm like, yeah, Cause, well, because they were gonna pay you, I assume. Well, when I first, and so 2000, um, I was on the culinary team for the US. And um, one of my team members was actually hired from California to open up the culinary division of the school in Alabama, Culinard Division of Virginia College. And they didn't have a baking and pastry program. And she said, We'd like, I'd like you to come down, meet with the owners of the school and talk about establishing a baking and pastry program because that's what they want to do. So I went down from Maryland, I flew down to Alabama, and basically they handed me the blueprints of an empty building, and they said, if you want the project, it's yours. To build a school from scratch, to design the facility, to write the program, to hire the faculty, and I thought this is just an opportunity that I can't, I can't give up, or you know, I have to accept, because when might I have that opportunity again? And it was such a learning experience for me too in, in, in being part of that, that role. And we got the Baking and Post Pasty program up and running and that started. And then they put me as vice president and executive director of the whole school. Um, so I was 26 faculty, 500 students, um, which was amazing. But you know, the thing is with me, I, and I began to realize like my heart is in the food. My heart is not in spreadsheets and, and you know, I love I spreadsheets. Dealing with They're awesome. Employees, spreadsheets are the best but... part of my job. I love like <laughs> email and spreadsheets. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I did that for a little bit and then I, I resigned and kind of got back into the industry and did some, um, you know, consulting and I would go back and forth to Atlanta and stuff. And, you know, of course I was in, you know, Birmingham, Alabama, I mean, it's actually a really cool place lots of you know independent restaurants and i love hiking and things there's lots of parks around and places to go but you know the one that there wasn't a lot of other opportunity for me job wise and so i ended up going i got a job offer in baltimore um at a school there and i went up the, I, so i went up and i actually moved to pennsylvania and went to work at the school and then from there it led to other openings and then so that before the last eight years really I was the program director of a pastry art school in Pennsylvania, and that was super. I mean, I you know got to run the pro run the program, form it, um, and it went really well. But then our ownership changed, and I could feel that the freedoms that I'd enjoyed or the things that were important to me gradually were beginning to change a bit. And that's when I started. Okay, I want to look for something else that's going to be challenging, but that's that's going to be a good move for me. And then. I just, you know, I was at a show in New York and I just kind of heard on the grapevine that Felton is looking for, um, a, you know, technician, chef, sales in the US. And I, and I went back and I read the job description on their website and I was like, I can do that. How could they pick anybody else? Clearly. So, so I applied and of course I got the job and now in June it will be three years. Yeah. And you get to work with one of my favorite people in the entire world. Anil, right? Yeah, I, I work with lots of great people. Anil's great. He comes over to the States fairly regularly. Um, when we're in Switzerland, we spend a lot of time together. Now, we, of course, we're on Zoom meetings and things all the time. Um, but yes, super person. Really, really humble, great tech, you know, amazing chef and so nice. And I think back to where this all started, which was us talking about, you know, what is, what is the expectation coming out of culinary school? And I think one of the things that maybe is missed is it does matter who you work for, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I think, and not because they're going to get you somewhere, no. but because, because they're going to they're gonna be able to impart something on you. And yeah. Anil, AWOL, yeah. 
whoever, yeah. Yeah. Right? there's there's a piece of how do you become a chef? You, right? Like I'm working with somebody that's going to teach me how to be a chef. Mm -hmm. And I'm teaching with somebody who's going to teach me how to make a, um, a chocolate curl. Right? Yeah. And both I mean, of these I, things are important. Yeah. Right? It's, um, I see it now, like my, you know, a son, Nick, on, he's 28. And he's also in the industry. And um, I mean, you know, in a way, we know where he should go, right? And who he should be with. But everybody's worked for, you know, again, it's that mentor. It's that person that's going to really push you. And I think it's always good to be in a place where you, you're not, you don't quite feel comfortable because then you're pushing yourself, you're growing. If you get to the point where it's like, I, you know, I, I've got this kind of, and it, it, especially when you're younger, when you're growing, you, you need to be out of your comfort zone and put yourself out of your comfort zone. And, you know, that's, that's why I moved to a different country and, I, and I've lived now in four countries. And I have no fear of going anywhere. Um, and maybe in some ways it's not, you know, you don't put down the same roots, I think. Um, my friends are all over the world. That's where I see my friends, you know. And um, not necessarily in the neighborhood, but, but it's just a different style. It's a different type of life. And, you know, there's, there's good and there's bad and it's not for everybody. Um, but you, you make where you are, you make, you make it what you want it to be wherever you are. Right, there's, there's, there's a positive experience mm -hmm. in all of those, right? Yes. I, look, I, you and I probably both work for people that I would not tell you to go work for. I work <laughs> with people that I wouldn't tell you. People work with me that would tell you not to work with me. But, <laughs> like, there, there's, there's, there's learning and there's growth in all of those experiences, right? Yeah. And, and it, back to the competition thing, like, it pushes you. Co competition is another one of those experiences. Yeah. That, like, yeah. I'm too old for that stuff now. Like, you know, but doing it when I did it pushed me to be better. Yeah. You, even when I, even yeah. when I didn't win. Yeah. Right? You get critiqued and, and guided and your work is analyzed constantly. I mean, it's like, when do you... When do you do that? Or when do you build those show pieces? I mean, if I wasn't, you know, like doing the Culinary Olympics, I wouldn't be making sugar flamingos or lobsters and things because it just, there's not, you wouldn't find, I don't think, there's always other things that need doing, you know? And it, it really pushes you, you're outside your comfort zone, you have to be able to take critique. Right. You're being pushed a long way in a short time and very technically as well. And now um, I'm very fortunate now I'm the coach, pastry coach for the U.S. culinary team. Right. So that we'll compete in Luxembourg 2022 on behalf of the U.S. Uh, and then in 2024 at the Culinary Olympics. So it's great. I love, you know, now I can be involved and I will be completely there with the competitor. I mean, as a coach, I want to be able to, that if they can't do the program, I can do the program. I want to be that vested in that person and what they're doing. And now I'm, you know, very fortunate. I was asked if I would be the coach and I, and I, you know, I'm honored to be that, be that person. But, um, and I still feel I'm growing. I mean, I'm this year I'm going to be 60. It's kind of scary, but I, I'm like, I'm still feel that there's, there's things to learn and places to go and, you know, right. somebody to be. Um, and that, try and you know be positive and now of course this past year our lives all have changed and my life before COVID was traveling 60 percent at least of my time so again i've had to like reposition myself and find well how am i going to make this work from my home base right. um which i've had to do we've all gotten really good at zoom <laughs> videos like we are going live i still can't, I still can't figure out the mute button like they, I still have to get told by people in my office you're on mute at least three times a day. <laughs> okay, Susan, we're running out of time. And yes. I, and but I do I have to ask my question because I ask it to everybody and it's kind you know it's coming and it better be like a Cadbury that you can get on at a tube stop. Okay, so that's my only rule for you. You're waiting for the the two a.m. tube back to back to the hotel, maybe after too many cocktails. But I didn't say that. And you have one pound coin that you're going to stick in the machine. <laughs> What sweetie do you buy? I would probably get Twix, but I love like the crunch and the caramel. And now I probably find the chocolate too sweet. Um, but 
that combination, I think, is just really, really good. So and this, there's this, two of them. So right. I could eat one and save one for later. Or eat both of them. Or just eat both of them. They even make them in, like, groups of four. Yeah. <laughs> so Who Christina, has a small one? You know? Christina, my wife would tell you, that's not a candy bar. That's a chocolate-covered cookie, just so oh. you know. But whatever. <laughs> this, I'm not going to get into that debate. Hey, Susan, this has been awesome. Thank you. Thanks. And you know what? You know, there's, we, I feel like we left out chocolate, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll get you back like at some point and we can like talk about like, like Felkland and we can talk about how you chocolate. We can talk about chocolate some other time. Yeah. So I see lots of um, our customers and friends on online as well. So thank you very much for, um, for listening. And thanks, Susan's um, sister. Thanks yeah, sister. Julia. She's in Wales. Bye, Julie. <laughs> She's surrounded by sheep. <laughs> Did they stay? Weren't they leaving? I thought they were leaving Great Britain. They decided to stay? They stayed. They, they, they moved to Wales. But I mean, like, I thought Wales was leaving Great Britain. Oh, I don't think so. I think it's too small. There's just too many sheep by themselves. You know, that, that wouldn't work. All right. Scotland, maybe. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Hey, help me out. Can you hit your little X? Because I can't. Like, I'm trying to, like... You should